1946 and World War II has ended. Teenagers all around the world foster an explosion of youth culture. This is the case in Indonesia as well, but with a violent twist. Welcome to the Indonesian War of Independence, a Time Goes miniseries that follows that struggle year by year from 1945 to 1949. I'm Indy Nidell. Last year, I talked about British forces trying to maintain order in Indonesia as the Dutch get back on their feet after the war and try to resume control over their former colony. However, a nationalist spirit has arisen in the Indonesian people. Irregular youth groups assemble and radicalize in spite of President Sukarno's efforts to keep them contained. Fighting erupts throughout Indonesia and despite attempts by the British, the Dutch, the Japanese and the Indonesian Republicans to stop it, violence sweeps the archipelago. That the youth movements are a force to be reckoned with becomes clear already when Sukarno proclaims independence in August 1945. Before he even utters a word of the Declaration of Independence, groups of young Indonesians take to the streets where they distribute leaflets and spread the word of the upcoming proclamation. They urge people to raise the red and white flag or to use merdeka, meaning freedom, as a greeting. These groups of young people adopt the name Pemuda, meaning youth fighters groups of which originated actually as communist youth movements. They operate independently of each other though, and take orders from none as they commit themselves to fighting for the new republic. But they are increasingly confronted by the larger world in which they live. They become aware of the contrast between their standard of living and that of the Europeans. In films, radio broadcasts and magazines, they see, hear and read how the Dutch enjoy a luxurious life paid for by the plundering of their Indonesian homeland. The decadency of the arrogant white leaders living in their mansions with dozens of Indonesian servants is an everyday reminder of the unequal balance of power. They are fed up and they are ready for change. And their methods are radical and violent. Last time, we saw how everybody starts fighting everybody at Java and Sumatra. The Pemuda are a catalyst in this violence, and not a small one either. 120,000 Indonesians were trained by the Japanese during their wartime occupation. The Japanese shaped the youth of Indonesia into a daunting military force and fueled them with anti-Western sentiments. But now the Japanese have lost their control over the radicalized youths. The Japanese-controlled armies are disbanded, leaving tens of thousands of leaderless soldiers. Many join the Permuda, who seized 20,000 rifles from the Japanese to add to their arms of sharpened bamboo spears and machetes to defend the Republic. One fighter writes how he joined the Permuda. As a youth already ripe with military training during the Japanese occupation, I joined them and became a member of the Angkatan Permuda Indonesia, the API. Every evening we would attack. The first targets were Japanese army installations. Then we fought, opposing the British and the Dutch. Another fighter explains how they handled those foes. Enemies were no longer taken prisoner. They die. They had to die. The corpses of the enemy were allowed to stay where they were sprawled out. The attacks continued. Always forward. Always attack. Kill and only kill. Which is more than unsettling for the Dutch who are returning to what they think is still their colony. Former Minister of Colonies Hubertus van Mook, or Huib, leads the Netherlands Indies Civil Administration, NICA, a paramilitary organization tasked with restoring order under Dutch rule. They get a shock in January when they enter Jakarta. Posters and graffiti plaster the city, screaming pro-independence phrases like, we will purchase our freedom with our blood, and up, Indonesian Republic, death with colonization. The troops arriving to the city are somewhat intimidated by these fierce pledges of allegiance to the Republic, but any delusions the locals may have about the Nika's purpose fade away upon arrival. They are here to secure their colony. The difference between them and the Pemuda is that the Dutch are pretty well organized and well equipped. The various Pemuda are practically leaderless. It's a mass movement though, and a true youth culture grows out of the Pemuda organizations. They let their hair grow long to well over their shoulders. Some are unshaven, they wear high boots, they carry revolvers stuck in their belts. Such fashion statements mark their position in the revolution, even as they 
really are defining a nationalist identity for themselves, as anti-colonial sentiment permeates ever more of Indonesia. But they lack organization. They operate in scattered independent divisions and are not controlled by any higher power. Some public figures do align themselves with the Pemuda movement and do give them a voice in the media. BM Dia, for example, is a journalist and committed revolutionary even during the Japanese occupation. He helps Pemuda Group seize a Japanese printing press, which he then uses to print the radical paper Merdeka Daily with updates on the nation's struggle. But it doesn't seem to really matter that the Pemuda are leaderless. They have the numbers on their side and their mindset makes them deadly dangerous. They have everything to gain and they have nothing to lose. They live by the words, better to die today than to live in misery and once free, forever free. Their chants equate colonial rule with death, which eventually becomes a mantra for the general Indonesian population and a motor for historical change. Radical pro-independence units spring up around places like, like schools and universities. Though the headquarters are often makeshift and only focus on regional activities, hierarchy in the Pemuda ranks is simply determined by who's the bravest. Ability, courage, that's all. Whoever is daring, put them in front, says one fighter about the disorder. But courage alone, you know, that won't do against the Dutch, who are better equipped and trained and are pretty ruthless as well. In January 1946 alone, they kill 8,000 Indonesians. And with support from British troops, the Dutch secure a hold on the major cities. In many cases, this is accompanied by great tragedy. On March 26, the British 26th Indian Division collides with the Pemuda in Bandung on Java. The Indonesian Republican Army is also there. General Sudirman, leader of the latter, knows they cannot defeat the enemy. So they accept a British ultimatum to evacuate the city. As the army and the Pemuda withdraw though, they torch the south side of the city, burning homes and looting businesses. This gains infamy as the Bandung Sea of Fire. Some 200,000 residents of Bandung lose their homes and their livelihoods. It is a PR nightmare for the Indonesian Republican nationalists. But away from the cities, rural areas which have previously been sheltered from the revolution are now an easier target for the Republicans. Even though it's been over six months since Sukarno proclaimed independence for the nation, the rural areas are only just learning about it and they are ecstatic. Many of them live in poor social and economic circumstances and their colonial governments still maintain a feudal system. Class tensions now explode. Many local upper class leaders had enriched themselves over the backs of their fellow countrymen by working with the Dutch. And now the lower classes take revenge. In what is called the East Sumatra Social Revolution, sultanates are overthrown and whole aristocratic families are killed. Communist groups also join in, seizing the opportunity to help start the class war. This buys some time though for the Republicans to get their facts straight which is easier said than done. The Pemuda, for example, are associated with the Indonesian National Party, the PNI, but they're really only loyal to Sukarno directly. But in the eyes of some, and especially in the eyes of the Dutch, Sukarno is a fascist who collaborated with the Japanese during the war. So while he keeps on in the background as president, Sutan Sharir, a Dutch educated Indonesian nationalist who we've seen before, is appointed prime minister. This signals that the Republican movement is, at least on the surface, willing to compromise to settle things with the Dutch in more ways than with just violence. Of course, as was already the case when Sukarno was pressured by the youth movements to declare independence, the Pemuda care little for compromise, freedom or bloodshed, right? The Pemuda class with Sharir, who does in fact want to negotiate with the Dutch. Sharir is not willing to have his efforts sabotaged by, by bands of wild youths. So he has the army arrest 12 prominent Pemuda fighters in May. In reaction, huge demonstrations erupt demanding their release. And ultimately, recognizing the power of the people, General Sudirman releases them. It is clear there is no centralized leadership by anyone really and other fringe groups smell opportunity and rush to the stage. 141 political and military groups unionize, calling themselves the Union of Struggle. 
led by communist Tan Malaka. Now, though the Pemuda originated as a communist youth group, they are now more aligned with Republicans, right? In fact, pro-independence youths call communist forces their musu, their enemy, just like they do the Dutch colonizers. But now, like Tan Malaka, they share a mounting distaste for Sharir's negotiations with the Dutch and his, his lack of urgency for the whole independence process. So on the 27th of June, Sharir is kidnapped and crowds gather ominously outside government buildings. In a chaotic struggle for leadership, Sukarno orders the release of Sharir and for the radicals to all be arrested. This becomes known as the July 3rd Affair and is the day that the Republican government and the army undergo a dramatic reorganization, swearing to take on more of the Union of Struggles commitment to total independence from the Dutch. Still, months later in November, Sharir negotiates an agreement with Allied representatives. By then, all British soldiers have been withdrawn from the islands, but in their place are 150,000 Dutch soldiers under Van Mook deployed there with the sole purpose of restoring colonial order. British diplomats arrange for the Dutch and the Indonesians to enter political talks to reach some agreement about the future of the nation. In the Lingajati Agreement, signed November 15th, the Dutch recognized the Indonesian Republicans as the de facto authority in Java, Sumatra, and Madura. That power is to be cemented in a federal United States of Indonesia, where they will share their power with other states. The USI would remain tied to the Netherlands under the Dutch crown in a Dutch-Indonesian union. According to the agreement, the USI must become a reality by the first day of 1949 at the latest. But though this might look like a light at the end of the tunnel, both parties have a sour taste in their mouths. This sentiment is crystallized on the battlefield just days after the agreement is signed. On November 20th, the Dutch make an attack in Bali in the Battle of Margarana. The youth of the Pemuda are not satisfied either, not at all. They continue their brutal guerrilla campaigns against the Dutch as before. To them, securing national independence depends on eroding Dutch imperial stamina, which will come at a great cost because the Dutch too will grow relentless in their struggle to regain control. And anyone who thinks that peace is around the corner has not been paying attention and is likely a big target to one, both, or all sides. If you'd like to see a Between Two Wars episode about how popular culture changed after the Great War in the 1920s, you can check out our episode about the Roaring Twenties right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Ilya Malencia. Thank you, Ilya. There are no words to describe, okay, there are actually plenty of words to describe our gratitude like the ones I'm using now. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you in the Time Ghost Army. It is your support that funds this and all of our programming. You can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe, ring that bell. See you next time. <laughs>